was a cold and blustery evening, that fateful day in 1847, when mad Geoffrey boarded the 730 train to Edinburgh. The sky was red and streaked with wispy mauve clouds, which moved quickly with the west wind across the flat of Killigrain Moor. Mad Geoffrey took firm hold of his hat, lest it be blown away, then boarded the second-class carriage and seated himself in an empty seat by the window. There were twelve people on the train, in all its carriages, of which there were four. As the train pulled out of Killigreen Station, it whistled, and in a wee moment had attained a speed of forty miles per hour. As the firemen fed the fierce furnace with black Dunfries coal, the light from the glowing firebox gleamed orange in the fading half-light, until the last traces of it became invisible from Killigreen Station. Presently, the locomotive slowed its momentum, and the fast pulsating rhythm produced by its engine slowed to a more sedate pace. Aye, this'll be Dunlear Station, chuckled mad Geoffrey to himself. The train puffed slowly into the station, and with a squeal of metal jolted to a stop. Wooden doors swung open, and the gentle hiss of steam could be heard. Women with small children carrying hat boxes and a number of small cases entered the carriage. Bairns, mused Geoffrey, chuckling to himself. The station master was supervising the lighting of the station lamps, but when the last of the wooden carriage doors were slammed shut, he turned his attention to the train and waved his green flag and blew his whistle, and the train began to move again, creaking and jolting as it did so. Mad Geoffrey looked at his watch. It was now two minutes past eight. Eight people had entered the carriage and only two had departed. He smiled. The more the merry, aye, he said to himself, affirming his own statement. He looked about the carriage, and seeing that he was perceived by no one, took up his small wooden surgeon's case, running his fingers along its lacquered honey-coloured surface. A small brass plaque proclaimed in engraved letters the name of the case's rightful owner, and the date of his acquiring the article. Dr. James Douglas McBride, 1839. Geoffrey opened the brass catch, and with a cautionary glance to see that he was not observed, lifted the lid. The good Dr. McBride's instruments lay in their felt emplacements, just as he himself had set them upon the last occasion on which he had actual possession of them. Aye, is that no a sight, he said. So pretty, like shining angels. There were several scalpels and a saw, and some hypodermic syringes and a great number of other devilish-looking implements of various shapes and sizes. Aye, what pretty bends! Aye, what pretty bends! He repeated to himself, rocking unconsciously gently from side to side. The train began to slow again, slowing to such an extent that Mad Geoffrey was suddenly awakened from his trance-like fascination with the contents of the surgeon's case by the jolting of the train as it stopped at Glatermore Station. Geoffrey quickly shut the box and slipped it into his canvas bag. Another four people got into the carriage at Glatermore. The carriage was filling up nicely, and Geoffrey rubbed his hands with glee. The next station that they came to was called Dunnerton, and another eight persons boarded the train there. It was now pitch black outside. It would be at least an hour before the train would reach the next station, so Geoffrey found his small leather-bound book and began to read it. It was called The Savage History of Sawney Bean and His Family infamous for their wanton consumption of human flesh during the reign of King James VI of Scotland. And it was about the savage story of Sawney Bean and his family, infamous for their wanton consumption of human flesh during the reign of King James VI of Scotland. Mad Geoffrey knew that story well, for it was his favourite, and its worn leather cover lay as testament to the fifty or so times that Geoffrey had read that edition. Sawney Bean had been the son of a ditch digger, but finding his father's life of drudgery and toil not to his liking, took to a life of robbery and murder. Marrying a wife of similar persuasion to himself, they went to live in a cave on the coast of Galloway, where they proceeded to abduct the entire population of the area. There was a detailed description of the main horrors and of the evil ends which befell these unfortunate wretches at the hands of the Bean family. This was the most finger-marked and dog-eared chapter of the whole work. During the time that they practised their butchery, they acquired a taste for human flesh, and so began to consume their victim's bodily flesh. In time, the King got to hear of the great disappearances of persons in that area of Galloway, and so ordered all the innkeepers of that country executed, just in case it was them. However, it was not. 
It was the infamous Beans. In time, the king himself led an expedition to find out the cause and discovered the cave. This was Mad Jeffrey's second favourite chapter. For it detailed the hideous larder of human artefacts, all of them pickled in vinegar, which befell the king's eyes. As for Tsorny Bean and his heathen family, they were all of them executed and buried on that hallowed ground. Bother and damnation! Bother and damnation! This will never do! He said, taking out the gold pocket watch, also inscribed Dr. G. D. McBride. The clearness of the night did not suit Geoffrey at all, and he began to fidget. It was twenty minutes to eleven. In twenty minutes time they would be in Blanor. At two minutes past eleven, the train pulled into Blanock station. And to his further dismay, he found the platform deserted, and several people terminated their journeys, thereby emptying the carriage of half its persons. Hey, at least the wind has not backed, sighed Geoffrey. It would be midnight and thirty minutes before they reached McAgis, and it looked for all the world as if my Geoffrey's plans had come to naught. My plans are ruined, he mumbled, stifling a sob, and a small tear appeared in his right eye and trickled down his cheek. The poor man was quite desolate. All the hopes he had had for his journey seemed broken. It's no fair, it's no fair, he sobbed to himself, clasping his hand in the attitude of a poor wee schoolboy, off to public lodgings for the first time. He looked a very picture of despair without his mother to comfort him. The train puffed and rattled out of Blanock Station and back into the black night. There's only one big town left to go, muttered Geoffrey to himself. At that moment, old Macduff the guard was thinking likewise. One more station to go before Edinburgh. At least one more station that really mattered. In fact, there were six more stations after that. But it would be two o'clock by the time they reached the first of these, and 6.45 by the time they reached the last. And old Macduff had a bottle of 15-year-old Cairnacareless malt whiskey. And so by the time the train pulled into Edinburgh Station, old Macduff would know little about it. And why, gentle and godly readers, should he so? For that very day was his birthday. Poor Geoffrey was quite downcast. Not even the savage history of Sony Bean and his family, infamous for the wanton consumption of human flesh during the reign of King James VI of Scotland, could console him. For he huddled in the corner of his seat like a wee dormouse, feeling quite unwell through disappointment and worry. Through the night, the train continued its journey, and Geoffrey, his spirits now as extinguished as the daytime sun, watched vacantly out of the window. They were the beginnings of a sea fog, and it seemed to thicken slightly as they got further south. The train made contact with the sea again, driving down towards Clacken Cove. The train stopped here and waited its obligatory minute. But there were no passengers. The fog had collected in the recessed geography of the cove, and the harbour fog bells sounded, muffled by the gloom. The train pulled out and presently started climbing till within a few moments it found level running and lessening of the fog. As the train rattled and vibrated in rhythm to the joints and the tracks, Geoffrey gradually dozed to sleep. There were 34 persons in all that train. There was a shrill whistle, a slam and a loud hiss of steam. Mad Geoffrey awoke with a start. The train jolted and began to move. Geoffrey peeked out of the window through the steam and read Glenock Truss on the station sign. And mercy be, the carriage was full of people. Geoffrey was delighted and wriggled his hands together in sheer pleasure, hunched himself together like a ticklish schoolboy. The fat middle-aged matron sitting on the opposite seat found this most peculiar and snorted with displeasure. And fiddly dee to you, madam, answered Geoffrey, giggling to himself. At this the matron turned away sharply in disgust. She heard with her an equally fat little boy who stared at him sullenly. When Geoffrey looked at him and poked out his tongue and, and said, Fat wee laddie, I'll eat you for dinner. I beg your pardon, asked the matron. I was just remarking the wee lad has a... He's a porky little fellow. He'll make somebody a fine fat pie one day, I'm sure. The boy immediately turned scarlet with embarrassment and after several seconds of hesitation on what mad Geoffrey had said, burst into a high-pitched whine. Why, of all the horrible things to say to a sensitive wee lad. You are a nasty wee man and I'll thank you to keep your opinions to yourself, if you don't mind, sir, spoke the matron. As you wish answered Geoffrey, quite chuffed with his rejoinder. Between the matron and the boy sat a wee girl with a wee smug face and a bonnet like her mother's. 
She might now began to tease her brother, calling him Porky over and over again, between squeals of pig-like laughter. Well, you know, keep your quiet, snapped the matron to the girl. Ah, you cannot talk, Geoffrey interrupted, staring directly at the female child. You've got a feast like a nasty toad. And he poked out his tongue as far as it would go. The girl immediately stopped squeeding and began to wail and cry. You are a horrible little wee man, and I hope the Lord sees it in his heart to forgive you, the matron said loudly. Probably not, answered Geoffrey and chuckled. The fat matron fought hard to subdue the fires of woe and lamentation that raged through her two charges. And having finally silenced them, instructed them by no means to look at mad Geoffrey, but to look out of the window, into the blackness, at things they couldn't see. The fog swirled thicker now, and from time to time the matron would remark that she feared that Mr. McDougal would never find his way to Glen Lyon Station to meet them. Geoffrey was tempted to inform them of the hideous beast of Glen Lyon, the vile fog monster who was positively known to haunt those parts, and to drag his victims straight down to hell with him, and of the absolute certainty that the beast would be abroad tonight, on this particular date. It was something just newly invented in Geoffrey's mind, but it was already dark and ancient to him. Anyway, he decided to hold his peace, contenting himself by watching the ever-thickening fog with rising contentment. He was interrupted by a metallic clatter as something rolled from under his seat to the middle of the aisle between the rows of seats. Mad Geoffrey realised what was amiss immediately, and before anyone could discover his dreadful secret, sprang after it like a cat, and scrambling under various seats, retrieved the clattering article before anyone could guess its secret. The item in question was an army officer's primer stove, which had been made by Coalbridge of London for Colonel, later Major General, Alistair Ronald MacDonald in 1797, three years before Geoffrey's own birth. It had been with a brave general in the Peninsula campaign. Later, during an abortive campaign whilst in the service of the Emperor of Brazil, subduing the Wimpimpi Indians, MacDonald had fallen into their hands and had been devoured, along with his entire staff in a huge black pot in the tribal capital. The Primus stove had, by courtesy of the Brazilian army, been retrieved and returned to Scotland to be presented to the late general's widow, who expired with grief immediately upon receiving it. This whole series of events had so enthralled Geoffrey that he had purchased the Primus in an auction, outbidding everybody there and paying nearly ten pounds for it, many times its worth, and nearly all of his savings. Geoffrey's eye caught the fat boy looking sheepishly at him. And well he might, because it was he, for the aimless kicking of his legs against the seat, that had caught the stove and sent it to rattling. Geoffrey was about to deliver a sound admission when the train began slowing down and presently squeaked to a halt in a sea of fog which engulfed Glen Lyon Station. The matron and her two fledglings got up and began to gather their baggage and belongings, and with Christian fortitude disembarked out into the fog towards the dim light of an awaiting carriage. The doughty matron gave the carriage door a slam, which resounded in the still night air. Macduff peered along the platform, trying his best to penetrate the thick fog with his vision and to ascertain if there were any more passengers to embark or leave the train. Satisfied that there were none, he waved his lantern and blew his whistle as a signal for the train to proceed. The godly matron watched him make his way back to his van, and betrayed by the illumination of his lantern could see the wretched man swaying and wobbling like the very Tower of Babel fit to fall. Puff, she snorted. The devil's brew. The locomotive whistled her farewell to Glen Lyon, and with a huff and a puff, slowly pulled out of the station, the dim outline of the rearmost carriage disappearing almost at once into the night fog, only the dim red taillights remaining visible until it, it too was gone, leaving only the permeating odour of coal smoke to suggest that a locomotive had ever been. The good mother and her two lambs found welcome sanctuary to the guiding crop of Mr. McDougall, and as he conveyed them to the shelter of Christian rafters, she enlightened her brother the minister of her ideal at the tongue of the odious and impertinent little man. And thus it was that the Trinity were the last people to see the passengers of that infamous and tragic journey alive and breathing in the mortal sphere of the world. The train pulled into Waverley Station at 27 minutes past seven that morning. It was a clear and beautiful morning without a trace of the suffocating fog of the night before. The conveyance was three minutes before schedule and as it came gently to its halt, 
The driver and his fireman wiped their hands of oil and coal dust and congratulated themselves on their punctuality. They stepped down onto the platform and began to chat with the small throng of porters who awaited with their trolleys to serve the weary passengers. Even the almighty and dignified station master himself was there, eyeing the gold watch which hung from its gold chain from his blue waistcoat with satisfaction, even condescending to nod in appreciation to the two engineers who respectively touched their caps in affirmation. The great clock of St. Giles's chained the half hour and the almighty and dignified station master inadvertently belched in sympathy, although he continued rocking gently back and forth on the soles of his feet, signifying that such things did not happen. But not a soul moved from any of the carriages of the train. The small group began to muse on what was amiss, as indeed did all the persons about the station. And as the minutes ticked by, they all ceased to chatter and fell silent in awful dread. The carriages remained stark and still. Not a soul moved and not a door opened. In time, the station master, being as he was almighty and dignified, felt all eyes upon him. And taking himself in hand as if he were a general, which in his own way he perceived himself to be, called upon two of the porters and led them to the train, and with but a moment's hesitation opened the door. The sight which met their eyes was the most hideous and sickening sight which was ever seen in Edinburgh or any part of Scotland in the entirety of time. Surpassing in barbarity even the great battles of Bunton, Rotten Hill and Stirling Bridge, and of all the wars and battles of the borders and the Kirk and the clans rolled into one. So numbing of the mind and wrenching of the stomach was it that it paled into insignificance all the persecutions and heresy and witchcraft in all the history of the Kirk of Scotland and all the exquisite tortures and persecutions practised by the Inquisition of Spain. So unspeakable and unutterably bestial was it that it put the bestial and unutterable practices of the heathen Picts and ancient Scots before their conversion by emissaries of the Holy Synod in Rome to the Christian religion to be likened to the mere playful pranks of an innocent kitten in comparison. Such was the sight and vileness and hideousy that it was worse in its effect than had all the above events been committed there at once and had Burke and Hare been a-snatching, and the Bean family been a-feasting to complete the horror. When he saw the sight, the station master let out a cry, and one of the porters turned out and wrenched the contents of his stomach onto the platform. The small throng took this as a signal to rush forward, towards the carriages, bracing their hearts to face whatever nameless and satanic horror lay within. The doors were flung open, the hideousness revealed to the morning light, and all its witnesses in the full awfulness of its ghastly, gory form. Mouths fell agape in disbelieving horror. Eyes lay transfixed upon the incomprehensible loathfulness which lay before them. It was the blood, the terrible red clotted blood that met them first. It dripped from the ceiling and puddled the floor, saturating the seats and oozing out of the open doorways and onto the platform. But it was the horrible contortions of the mangled and dismembered bodies that made them heave and wretch and cast out their breakfasts in torrents. The mutilated torsos and dismembered limbs which, like obscene and blasphemous statues in a vile gallery, in the very bowels of hell itself, which caused them to moan in lamentation, as if their very reason was left them. The lifeless protoplasm lay as if in grotesque mockery of all beauty and symmetry. The reaping murderous hand had levelled all from the highest to the lowest as same in the attitude of death. The righteous and respectable sextants from the various parishes of Perth, the gentlemen retailers of a barn and ladies of temperance and virtue of Inverness in the first-class carriages, they twisted and indistinguishable from the destitute and fallen women of Invergordon who occupied the rearmost carriages by virtue of tickets obtained by the good and philanthropic offices of the Society of Temperance and Moral Correction. Nor indeed were the blood-soaked carcasses of the diverse persons of middle station who now filled the middle two carriages distinguishable from those of their betters or inferiors. When the peelers arrived on the scene, they reacted much like the others on the station, but it was their lot to investigate the hideous massacre. 
Within minutes, the streets above the station began to hum with rumours, and within two hours, the whole of Edinburgh knew of the events. Within a day, the whole of the lowlands was ablaze with it, and within two, the highlands were aware, and on the third day, London and the whole of England and Wales were talking of it. The newspapers thanked whatever scoundrel god they prayed to, and soon all the courts and cities of Europe and America and the world were abuzz with it. The most terrifying and shocking discovery made amongst the carnage of that black night was the charred and blackened remains of various limbs in the first-class carriages, which had been roasted by the foul assassin and in a cannibal fashion consumed by the fiend, who even left his tooth marks in the barbecued remains. One man of the passengers only survived, struck completely mad, being confined for the remaining nine years of his life in an asylum, never to utter a single intelligible sentence again except on the subject of cheese. As for Mad Geoffrey, there was neither sight nor sound of him. He had left the train on that dark night on one of the stations between Glenlyon and Edinburgh. The matron and her brood had lodged safely under Mr. Douglas's rafters and were obliged to stay an extra fortnight there when the poor woman caught sight of the headlines describing the horrible murders committed the day before and swooned in terror, being committed straight to her bed where she remained for the space of two weeks. Her son, the wee porky chap, lived on to be a bishop in the Kirk of Scotland and died at the age of 80 in 1917 during the tenth year of the reign of King George V and in the fourth year of the Great War, looking then remarkably as he had done so whilst a boy, whilst the daughter followed him to the grave six years later. It was many a time that friends or dinner guests would be reminded of that terrible night aboard the Edinburgh Express. I'm going to go the way. I'll live the boy where I'll soup.